So I'd like to start from a very basic thing. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get into theoretical things too much, but I'd like to, uh, all of us to think about the fact that when we talk about HRM and our practices, basically we're talking about the fact that we do believe, uh, at least most of us do, uh, that the practices we put in place, be it performance appraisal, be it put evaluation, be it uh, hiring and recruitment processes, uh, have an impact on organizations through the fact that they affect individual and collective behaviors of people working within our organizations, and thereby, that's the, the basic assumption. So the whole practice, uh, the whole issue of HRM is building up those practices in a way that we can really affect performance at the company level. And that's where I'd like to point your, our attention to what's the topic of, of today in the end. So all of that is so complex by itself. And what when we add context? What if we add to that the fact that these processes might be varying a lot when the context around the company is varying? So that's, I've been working in this field for 20 years now. Uh, as an academic and as a practitioner from time to time. And my biggest concern has always been the fact that in 20 years, there's been always this kind of mantra going on that we are so important, why don't they recognize how important we are? And I, you know, and you know, if this happens when you are in your teens, it's okay. You want your parents to go there and say, pet you and say you are a good boy, but when you grow older, that's an issue. I mean, and uh, <laughs> we have to cope with the fact that probably there's something going on out there that is not just, you know, the other's fault, something we can do. And I like to see that as an opportunity, uh, that at four, five different levels. So, so what changes in the role of HR should we expect? And I add to this, should we promote, because again, I don't think that HR people need somebody to go up there and tell them what's their future. They, they are creating their future, and that's pretty much consistent with the, 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 the remarks that Jeanette uh, um, did at, at, at the stage. I really think that um, you know, we can change the way organizations are. I'm a firm believer that uh, we cannot keep thinking that things are going in a, some direction just because something out there is happening. Uh, it's what we do that changes what's going on out there. I'm not contending that, you know, a, a silly position like saying you're falling from the uh, 12th floor and you say it's not happening and then you, you survive. Uh, but on the other side, probably you could have avoided falling from the 12th floor and that's the point I would like to make here. So what's the role? What are the tools and practices? Uh, how should they change? What are the new competencies? And two more academic things. What's the ideology? What's the view of people that might be changing? And again, the epistemology. How should we change the way we learn about HR? Because I think this is a key point. If you go through research, it's as if we spent a lot of time trying to understand how did really HR affect behavior in the past and try to understand what was going on in organization. And then at some point, we just forgot about that. And we thought that we knew what we needed. And I think that's a key point. I think useful to use a metaphor that comes from uh, other sciences. Uh, my perception, that's the, the theme I've been working on ever since I joined the conference on the future of HR in Europe a couple of years ago is that much of HR we have in place today is akin to uh, geology. Uh, it means we are looking to stability so many times. It's true. We keep talking about change. But if you look through the practices we have, most of the time their goal is to average out. It's to force people on very specific expectation of role. We say people need to be entrepreneurial, they need to innovate, but again, we force them on uh, evaluation scales that are fixed out there. Uh, I know I'm stretching it a little bit, but it's uh, for purpose of discussion that uh, I think it's important to do that. We are looking at strata. We are still looking at the organization at you know different levels out there, and no matter what, uh, we keep saying, What's important is the way you contribute, but if you contribute higher up, 
much better than if you contribute at some other level down there. And that's okay. Uh, structure, we, we are, again, we are so connected to the idea that HR in the end, at the end of the day has to do with job design and the way we define jobs instead of the dynamics and the processes out there. So what if we thought of HR as moving into a different metaphor, that's ecology. And you know, ecology is something I've been working on because uh, of my interest in evolutionary theories. So try to understand how dynamics at the social system work when you take movement and change into, into place. You know, in ecology, what's important is not stability as much as dynamics, even though we know that dynamics can tend to some kind of stability. So what we are looking at is not, you know, people are performing the way we want, but it might be, let's see why do some people perform much better than others. So let's move our radar on a different thing. We have reached 80% of people behaving the way we want, that's okay. But what about knowing and learning from the 10% that are really doing extraordinary things out there? Think about an HR moving from this to that, from, you know, being sure that at the end of the day things have been done and moving into trying to understand what can be done in a different and much better way. And I'm sharing this with you for the first time. It's part of, as I told you, of an ongoing project. The idea is to come up with a book at some point, uh, but I'm still working on that. So what's going on? Uh, let's try to see, and I'd like really to have your feedback on that. If we moved from the idea of geology to ecology, how is the role of HR going to change? Uh, we know where we are today, loosely coupled roles, because no matter what we say, uh, most companies find it very hard to get really their business partner, their center of expertise, and their shared services work together smoothly as they should. And to me, that doesn't come as a surprise for one reason. Uh, Jeanette was citing my uh, interest with words. The words role has a very specific meaning in sociolo sociology. Role is part of, the, of a person. So a person can have different roles, but no way that a person subdivides himself in different roles. And, you know, that's, I think it's quite an issue there. I mean, if you take something that's unique and you say it has different roles, doesn't mean you can cut it into parts as it has been done. You know, th that's risky. All this idea of saying, you managers, you are part of this process, it's your responsibility, it's okay, but there comes a time where people say, okay, that's my responsibility, so what are you out there for? Yeah. So I think we need to move to the idea of inspiring management. I mean, uh, clearly in companies today, managers are so focused on very, at times, narrow objectives that it's very hard for them to take the medium or long-term perspective, or also see and think out of the box. Think of what's going on with people out there. So HR has to inspire to bring out new ideas on things that can be done within an organization instead of making sure that, you know, you don't have people out there creating issues. Yeah, no? Everything under control, we are managing them, you know, putting things under the carpets or <laughs> things like that. Talent framing to talent hunting, again, uh, I've seen so many talent management system uh, turning into, you know, we have to prescribe what talent is instead of a tool to understand what talent is really doing within our organization. So many times I get wonderful talent that are out of the radar because maybe they're a little bit controversial, they dress in a strange way, or they don't really behave the right way. And too many people being talent for their lifetime just because they went there and nobody wants to tell them they are not. Or even worse, nobody wants to tell their manager that, you know, the people they told us were talent are not that much talent as we thought. So talent hunting, try to find out what's going out there. So get out of the HR corporate offices and see what's going on within company. That in, at the end of the day, it's where everything started from. It's from job description to job laboratory. There are so many new jobs being created within our companies. There are so many new activities being done by people out there, and many times we don't know. We don't know because we don't go there. We don't see processes. We don't work where things happen. And again, we are losing out of a great chance, something that most time other top managers cannot do. 
from succession planning to succession hiking. So instead of telling people that's you know you are you know, on the succession plan, uh, try to help them try to understand what kind of path they can go through by themselves. Coming to the founding pieces of that, it means moving from an implicit behaviorism, the belief that our practices can make the world happen the way we like it. So, you know, uh, so many times uh, I end up discussing with friends of mine who are in corporate HR position back in Italy or around the world, whether they really believe that the way they change the goal setting changes the behavior of people. And I must say that, you know, after two or three beers, they ta start telling me the truth and they say, <laughs> You know, most people think so. I'm not so sure about that. But still, what, why should I change? Yeah. And that means also moving our epistemology from the normative. So the idea that these things work, and it will work forever, to the idea that we need to move into what we call collaborative management research. I'm very influenced by the fact that I moved to California to join a group of researchers who are working in that field. That means really taking what's going on within organizations as something we have to research upon and using all the tools we have and try to figure out how we can change the way things happen up. Uh, basically, I can draw on, on my experience, but also on the experience, uh, as was mentioned, of colleagues that are somehow connected to the collaborative management research movement. That's the like of Michael Beer, former Harvard, uh, or uh, Ed Lawler, and also Edgar Schein to some extent. So it's a growing movement of academic, and uh, Rami Shavni, the colleague I'm working with at Cal Poly at the, at, at the time. So the first thing is that our experience has been, uh, unfortunately, that it's easier to start zo those processes when you start those uh, one, one level uh, over the HR manager. So most of the time, the uh, most interesting projects dealing with analyzing from a research-based perspective what's going on within HR processes has been sponsored directly by the CEO or some top-line managers that wanted to know if this really working or not. So uh, I think this is a very sad thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and many times that also means some kind of difficulties with HR. Second thing is, obviously, I'm, I uh, enjoy a, a, a very specific position because uh, being an academic, many times you can, um, let's say, force uh, somehow uh, when you are called around the table to discuss something, you can force the idea that these things might not be working. Uh, and I understand this is not so easy many times, but uh, what I do is I take a couple of uh, um, uh, empirical research findings and I just tell them that quite, um, quite bluntly at times. Um, I'm not the nicer person when it comes to stereotyping on what works. And the reason being, I don't know whether it, it, it's, it's transparent there, but I think that HR is dealing with a, a wonderful thing that's uh, you, you, people. And we don't want our practices to be based on false assumption when they end up having an impact on individual beings. So I've seen that happening so many times and I don't like that. Um, third thing I do is I use a kind of uh, uh, Japanese-like, I mean Toyota-like thing. Whenever they tell me we want that, and I ask, I start asking why, and I use the five whys. So I, I really want to see. I mean, because if the reason is we want that because we want that, then I'm not the person to to talk to, and I, tell, I advise them to do it with somebody else because it's not what I think is useful to be to be doing that. But I understand it's very specific to my to my to to to, 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 to my history and, and so forth. And the final thing is I try to use data. You were mentioning uh, career ladder. And the last time that we were discussing something like that I uh, told them to take the list of the top managers they had in place. 
and I asked them to check how many of them ended up being there because they were part of the planning process. And to mm -hmm. their surprise, uh, you know, the, the, the system they had used probably wasn't so effective because most of them were not part of that. But we're talking about an Italian organization, so I understand it might be context dependent.